chapter we have arrived at a point where you know we can use delta G to do two things. One is basically uh, predict uh, spontaneity, right? And the other one is estimate the work you can get out of it, right? So those are two things that we uh, we have arrived when we finish talking about it. Now here, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use a little bit more example uh, to illustrate the application of Gibbs energy in uh, predicting directionality of something that's going to happen or not. Now, you, a lot of you probably have um, seen the application of this when we talk about chemical reaction, right? You calculate Gibbs energy of, um, of a reaction, and uh, if you get negative, you know it's spontaneous. We want to achieve some quantitative um, uh, calculation for delta G in terms of its spontaneity and also how we can affect equilibrium of a system by experimental means. So instead of jump into complex uh, system like a biological folding, uh, as you read the book, we talk about protein folding, DNA melting, they can all be studied using this quantity. Now this uh, beginning of this chapter will use something very, very simple, like we do in the ideal gas case. We use a simple model system to demonstrate a, some of the uh, basic concept. So let's just look at uh, phase transition. Right? It's actually uh, something very common. If you actually look at the water, uh, it can you, ha you can have like a solid, which you call the mass, uh, uh, ice uh, cubic, they can become a liquid. Um, they can also eventually evaporate as a gas. So this is a very familiar phenomenon where uh, we want to use to demonstrate a few things that we want to focus on today. Now, at a certain temperature pressure, if you have like a water, let's just say a, a ice particle floating on a water liquid surface. So now I'm asking you, tell me, how do we compare the Gibbs energy of the two uh, state of the system? This is, we're talking about zero degree water where the ice cube floating on it. Now, uh, in terms of Gibbs energy of water in this state, in the ice state, solid state, or water in the liquid state. Now, can you tell me if, if we were trying to calculate Gibbs energy difference of the two? Uh, let's just simply say the sign. Which one is bigger? Which one is smaller? Zero degrees Celsius. Just normal temperature we normally like. Any of your common experience? Who is bigger? Anybody raise your hand? I, I'm not calling name for the moment. Yeah. Uh, Diego? <coughs> delta G. Yeah. Delta liquid. Del well, yeah, we can say delta G, G liquid minus G solid. So what? It's positive. Okay, Diago says positive. So no, I, I'm not going to let you hook off the hook quickly. So if it's positive, what happens? I'm talking about zero degree one Celsius. Aaron, I'm not let you. I want to Diego <laughs> finish his talk. Okay. So uh, if it's positive, what what does that really mean? Who is bigger? Like well, so if it's if it's positive, what what will be the consequence of it? So it'll be larger than zero, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what will happen? I guess you basically say nothing will happen because the ice is going to float on the yeah the on the liquid. Right? Right. So, okay. So anybody else, Aaron? Are they equal? Yeah, it should be. And this is a little bit tricky question because we know it's not nothing is going to happen. So the then there is no spontaneous forward or backward action. So. It's a different way to use this equation. So basically, they're uh, equal. So in this case, so they're 
So this is what's going on. So, uh, so uh, we, we're going to use this concept quite a bit in the future when we deal with chemical equilibrium. So this is just the beginning when we talk about when something is at equilibrium, you can go back and forth. Uh, that means the gift NH on each side are equal. So it's all you can think of a ball on the level field is not going to roll uh, spontaneously, but only when you have difference in the height. So um, I, sometimes this gets a little bit uh, complicated when we talk about the total gift energy of uh, ice and water. Because you could have a tiny little ice floating in a big ocean, you have all, or you can have a gigantic iceberg in a little pond. Uh, they're all the same uh, equilibrium. So instead of talking about the total absolute gift energy, sometimes we just realize we only need to talk about, talk about the, the per more gives energy. So we, this is, that's a much more accurate way to describe a matter which state it's in uh, is more stable than the other state. So, so the molar gives energy is more often used in this case to describe whether the two phase will be at equilibrium or not. So this is the concept, again, we're going to use a lot later on. Right, so then, basically, if you have any matter in any phase, if the total mole gives energy, let's say the ice solid, uh, you can divide by total mole of this, and then we can actually uh, represent a mole of gives energy, which basically is per mole. So this is a mole number, and this is the total. So gives energy itself is a extensive quantity, but once it gets to here, it's a mole gives energy. So it's a better way to describe this is. If the uh, at zero degree one ETM, the ice and water are equilibrium, what really says is the motor, the solid, solid motor gives energy, and the liquid motor gives, gives energy are equal. So that means they don't go either way. It's just it's like uh, they're on the level, uh, the field of even. The molar gives energy. Yeah. Do you specifically want to use this for when we're talking about phase transition stuff, or just any? Like what yeah, that's a very good is question. It not to use? Yeah, at this moment we use to talk about phase transition. It become convenient because then we don't we don't have to worry about how big the iceberg is. Yeah. But uh, later on, uh, you ask a very uh, very important question that we will deal with later when we talk about. Uh, and, and another concept called chemical potential, but I'm going to defer this to later, but that's a very good question, which means the molar gives energy relate to another concept that's very important we'll deal with later. Austin? Why is it, uh, the equation, it says G solid over M, if what? Is it total because G S is equal to G L, or why Oh, is well, it could be, uh, this could be S, so there will be a G L total. Uh, N equals G L more. So whatever this this is the total log of more number of uh, liquid. So what this really means we we don't have to worry about the actual size of the solid or liquid as long as the molar gives energy of them are equal. You could have a big ice, you could have a small part of water, or vice versa. So that's. That's when the molar, molar gives energy become very handy when you predict that whether something will become another thing, you just use the molar gives energy. Right? So that's uh, the first uh, point I want to make for today. That is the introduction of molar gives energy and uh, how to use it to uh, observe the phase equilibrium when you have different uh, phase come together. Now, the second point we want to get is I want to start by asking a situation where, let's say, I have a beaker here. Uh, I have a liquid water. Uh, let's just say at 25 degrees Celsius, 1 atm. Obviously, this thing's not going to boil, right? I mean, you will have the common experience. So, um, and then when you heat it, 
it all started boil. And the reason for that is because the vapor pressure of water, when you reach 100 degrees Celsius, uh, the vapor pressure of water will start to be equal to the atmospheric pressure. So these are all common experiences. We, and in fact, on the homework, we were asking you to uh, calculate the, uh, the, the pressure different the, at the mountain and the bottom, the, the atom's pressure is different, and then the water boil at different uh, temperature. So here, this simple phenomenon actually has a lot of thermodynamic principle hidden behind it. So we want to use this example to introduce the next concept that I want to cover today. Now, at the normal pressure and the temperature, 25 degrees temperature, so if we use the Gibbs energy principle, we basically says the water is not going to boil that is, it's not going to rush into spontaneously into a gas phase on high pressure. So that means the Gibbs energy of the water in the liquid state under this pressure compared with the vapor uh, is bigger or smaller. Because water cannot go to gas phase at 25 degrees. So who's Gibbs, its Gibbs energy is? Yeah, so it can, it can actually go higher point, right? So if you get, it's very useful. The reason we keep, we change Gibbs into this funny negative thing is because it's, just, it's such an intuitive comparison with the ball on the potential. So if something cannot go over there, usually means it cannot climb over. Just use that principle. So in this case, clearly, uh, uh, it gives energy is lower than the gas phase when it's at, at one atm. So that means it cannot get, go high by itself. So what you can do is you boil it, right? So so then you can say like, wait a minute, what do we mean by boil it? Well, obviously when you boil it, you're going to change what? So when you boil it, you change water's temperature. That means. But if we go back to the principle of Gibbs energy to high pressure cooking it, it's much more efficient. So what's the principle behind that? So now you said I want to add more pressure, right? So when you add pressure, what do, what do you actually do in this case? It's harder to boil, right? Aaron, you want to help out? Can you increase the Gibbs energy? Yeah, so basically you push them. So basically you, you increase this guy. When you add, in, when you increase pressure, and then the Gibbs energy of the, uh, the, the gas will increase. So therefore, it's much harder for the liquid to climb up. So 100 degrees Celsius is no longer sufficient. Or, or however you can think about it. So you, just, you, know, you have to raise the temperature to a high, even higher to catch the increase of the pressure of the vapor, right? So, so what the, this story, our cooking experience, uh, showed us two important uh, parameters that we're very familiar with, we can manipulate. We do that every day in the lab, but more often in the kitchen. Right? So that is, you can actually change Gibbs energy by changing temperature or pressure. Right? So this is the uh, discussion point, the, the second important discussion point today. So. So, so this tells us that a very important uh, application of Gibbs energy 
is not just statically looking at system at equilibrium at a certain point. Uh, the extension of its application is we will uh, have some ability to manipulate the equilibrium for whatever the reason. You know, if we remember early days when we talk about differential scanning colorimetry to measure the melting point of the uh, protein folding, or in the case of cooking application, if you really want to cook something at a higher temperature, you do so by uh, altering, uh, changing the temperature or pressure. Okay? So it's a uh, it's it's very useful. Uh, experimental approach as well as uh, in, as you soon you will see that <coughs> uh, a quantitative way to think about how Gibbs energy can be uh, used to analyze this behavior but keep in mind we're not teaching this course so that you can be a better cooker uh, we really want to eventually relate this to biological phenomena like uh, protein folding, and DNA melting, or even more complex biological reaction that involving uh, Gibbs energy change and how temperature pressure will affect that. So an important question is how, how a tiny change of the system, let's say I have a system uh, at a temperature pressure, it has a Gibbs energy. So Gibbs energy is, you know, somehow you can express as a temperature or pressure. Because we know if we change temperature pressure, it all change. Aaron? Um, if it's a liquid, does the pressure happen? Uh, you'll see this very soon, but I will, uh, again, defer that question. But if I defer your question, forgot to answer it, uh, just, you know, poke me at the end of the class. It's, hey, you, you forgot to answer my original question. I try to remember that one. Uh, some of the question, uh, like Kalia's question earlier about the motor Gibbs energy, will be deferred later on because I don't want to spend too much time talking about chemical potential here right now. It's it's a much uh, uh, later concept. But the the question Aaron just asked will be answered uh, at today's lecture. Okay. So now I'm going to do another round of. So uh, let's work together. Let's just try to imagine that we're the first one try to answer the question. How do we actually understand the change of Gibbs energy in terms of the temperature pressure? Now, how, let's say we, we, we have done a bunch of these things, right? We're just sitting there pounding, assuming we don't have any textbook to read about it. Now, as a class, we want to work together. Can we solve this problem? And uh, if so, how do we do it? I need a volunteer to, to get us started on this one. Anybody? Oh. I'll give it a try. The question is how do we uh, find the, if I ever change a tiny amount of temperature pressure, how, do, uh, how would that affect the change of Gibbs energy? A little bit of mass, a hint, like when you have a function uh, you know, like you, you have a function that's changing, let's just say, depends on a parameter. So think about that as the temperature or pressure. This is the function that gives energy. I want to know when I change tiny of that, how that would be changed. So in terms of a mass, how do we do that? Anybody? Okay, that's right. So you take a derivative. But really, what do we mean by derivative? It just, it, it, it looks, this is a really scary equation, but uh, using the layman's language, this basically means I, if I make a tiny change of dx, what is the new, you know, like this is the x plus dx minus fx. That basically, I'm just, we're just trying to do this. Let's not, we don't, we don't have any derivative, we don't have any equation to write yet. But, we can use this approach. We're assuming we change ever so slightly, tiny little thing, and we can write this very clearly. Right? So basically it is, so just keep in mind. So now we have to find a way 
like what happens. If, so we needed to figure out if there's an ever tiny change of temperature or pressure and or pressure, how G is going to change. Any volunteer to go about um, Kalia? So, yeah. How how do we go about this? Well, if you're if you want to find equations with G, that's you can, like, make a determination of temperature. That's right? exactly. Imagine that I'm the one sitting in the classroom. I see this question. I'm like, no way I can solve this unless I know what how G is related to T or P. So that was a very good starting point. Now then. We don't. I mean, after this, uh, Professor Chen never told me how this whole thing uh, is about. I mean, how, how G is related to T and T. We never had an equation of that. that. That's not fair. So, but then, didn't we talk about G in terms of what H minus T is, right? Okay, let's just start something we know. Let's not worry about the final answer. Let's just go with what we know about G. Well, G basically is H minus T. Right? So, hmm. okay, for any given system, the Gibbs NH can be expressed as a we defined. So we can say, oh, okay, the tiny change of this can be caused by any tiny change of that. So this is just mathematically, we can say, okay, the tiny change must be due to the tiny change of this, and then the tiny change of this. This will need a little bit of a mass. Uh, manipulation here. So this is basically on the product two parameter, this usually can be expressed minus T D S minus S D T. So usually when we talk about this we try to limit ourselves to a so tiny step um, we can pretty much assume the temperature has not even changed yet. This is a, a typical trick we do. It's like when you do the dx, you can assume the, the function will stay uh, where it is. So uh, so this that means the t is constant in this case. So obviously you can actually remove one of those terms, right? So the dt can be. But we... Can I ask no, 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 this is, this is actually not true. So. <laughs> SPT is not, so this is not really, the tiny step is reversible, so we're going to actually use the uh, equation again, so that was wrong, so I, I think I was thinking of something else, we derived this earlier, so we, we got the T now, actually, think, I think someone probably already tried to point out, I made a mistake over there, so I, I quickly realized I was trying to think about earlier derivation, so, um, so how do we get the P, oh, and also there's some other term we don't really like, I would say tiny step because I was trying to introduce the reversible concept. Uh, and it, yes, so I'm just suggest that uh, it, we all we are single-minded trying to get to this point, right? We we want to. It's the same trick we did in last uh, uh, class. We want to relate the Gibbs energy to work. So here we don't. There's nothing really complicated. Or if you know the logic or, or how you think about this, this things actually become not so complex. If obviously if after all this explanation here, we know we want to find out how this changes over the temperature pressure. So here, and he's suggesting so well, we uh, we can actually express the uh, H in its original form because all of these are. Um, A, uh, just shortcut. Okay. Now, um, and again, we can do the same expansion of what we did here. The tiny change of enthalpy would be the tiny change of the internal energy and the tiny change of PV. Okay, so then here, this can be expressed just like you know, the other one. So, and we know that internal energy can be getting back to the Q and the W. The, so not, not get to work, because we all know at the very, very beginning when we introduced this class, we knew Q and W are the something we can 
related to the temperature and the work. And the work, when you put the system is not doing any else work, it's a tiny small change, it's basically a volume expansion work. So this, we already get somewhere very, very close. And I know that sometimes people use a tiny work, but you know, we just use the work uh, and for the internal energy change. People can put D there, but it doesn't matter. We just put a D just an emphasis, it's a tiny step. Okay, so we can put the D there if we wish, just like we normally, uh, well, I guess some of the textbook situation, but you know, uh, I'm always a little bit concerned about it because it's not a state function, so it's weird to use yeah. dw dq. But if it's a, if we were just make it clear, it was just representing a tiny step. So here, and then you can pretty much uh, express this into pdu plus bdp minus tds as as dt. So um, again, I'm going to just keep saying this is still a tiny step. Like when Newton first figured out how to do uh, derivative, he focused on tiny step. We use similar argument here. So if it's tiny step, uh, then the system was kind of a maintained in the reversible point. Uh, in this case, uh, if it's reversible, we know that uh, the dq uh, equals basically t d s. Right. So basically, this is dq. This recall. This is what we have originally uh, observed. When you're on the, since it's so tiny stuff, you can think of the temperature didn't change. All to do is this is a little bit tricky. We're talking about temperature, the pressure changing. But it, this is a, normally when you mathematically trying to figure out the derivative, and you can assume it is so small. So this t and t prime is, can be considered to be similar as long if the step is infinitely small. Um, similarly, if you the work, uh, it was expanding out, so the work would be minus PdV, right? So this, uh, all of this quantity we defined earlier can be used to uh, figure out. So if, the, if you add temperature or pressure to the system, the system will change in something, expand a little bit to the work, absorb the heat, uh, the heat will cause some uh, entropy change, but it also causes expansion of the work. All of this at the end of the day, when it's all done, if you put it over here, so, Only left with this two terms. Any questions so far? Okay, so if I start off derive this equation, you might say, "What the heck we're doing?" Uh, hopefully, by now it's not so uh, so mysterious. Even though it looked pretty long, you know, arduous process to get here. <coughs> but if you if you keep your in mind, the reason we're doing this is because we try to get to this point, then this becomes not so uh, you know, uh, confusing at least. It, it still takes somewhere, but it, it was the, it, you know, we, we used exactly the same strategy from last uh, lecture when we tried to relate Gibbs energy change to work. Here, the same thing. So uh, clearly, that means if you change the the system's temperature pressure, you will cause Gibbs energy change in these uh, terms. Now, obviously, uh, I forgot what was the question Aaron you asked earlier. If liquids would have pressure change. Okay, so yeah, that, that's a, that's a good point. We'll go back to that question. But before we get to that point, I want to say this equation actually uh, means that the, there are two parameters you can uh, alter to cause the change of the Gibbs energy. Now, in mathematical terms, sometimes we refer this as partial derivative, even though here we use the derivative. So, so basically we'll say, hey, you know, the G actually is a function of temperature pressure. But, you know, if I fix uh, the, uh, the, temp uh, the, pre uh, the temperature, this means I fix the temperature, I change just the pressure, and then this will be the volume 
of this system. Um, but typically, when you uh, change the liquid or when you change the, uh, the gas, you won't matter. So I hope, Aaron, what do you think is the answer to your own question? I think no. I mean, the pressure will yeah. It is so it doesn't change the, uh, uh, the I, I, I keep saying, okay, you just stare at the equation, you answer no. No, 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 look at this. Let's look at this. Let's see. So I'm saying that I have any, I, when I derive this, I do not assume this ideal gas. Okay, guys, this is anything. Also, let's just say, let's have another example. You know, like, do you skate? Do you um, ice skate? I have. You, you have? Right, so you, you use your, the sharp blade uh -huh. on your guys? Uh, why, why do you need a sh very sharp uh, blade? Uh -huh. Yeah, so you melt the ice, you put pressure on the ice. Yeah. There's no gas in water, right? What are you doing there? So you, 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 you squeeze at the gas and, and the ice particle, and they become liquid. You didn't add any temperature yet. Let's assume. So you can alter Gibbs energy of solid. Because in this equation, I have a V. So the system's V. So if I'm talking about the molar Gibbs energy of anything, all I do is I have to the molar. The only, the reason Aaron come up a answer no, which is quite reasonable, is because the change of Gibbs energy of solid by pressure is usually so tiny because the volume is so small compared with gas. So uh, it's a much more significant change of Gibbs energy when you apply pressure on gas. That is because, generally speaking, gas has a much big motor volume or total volume. Whereas, generally speaking, the volume of solid, the model, the motor, if we have a motor, because the motor gives energy is what we use often to predict where they're going to go, right? So you want to know, when you apply pressure on the system, uh, how its motor gives energy going to change? Uh, that's what it says to us. That is, the motor gives energy change of that particular matter uh, in the system on the fixed temperature, it's going to be dependent on the molar volume. Now, obviously, sol solid or liquid has a much smaller molar volume. You, you, so you get a sense that mm, maybe it doesn't change. Well, well, it doesn't change a lot, but it does change. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just much smaller compared with gas. Okay? So we'll see that a little bit. Yeah. But obviously, another term we will also quite often use is the partial derivative of Gibbs energy. And we can also use the motor now, okay, if you wish. So it's temperature, pressure, but I, um, it changed over the temperature. If I fix at the pressure, and it will be minus S. Now, this looked kind of a, uh, kind of a mathematical hairy, but it wasn't that. It's just as simple as this that we're trying to talk about. We, we, we try to use this example to set up some uh, uh, quantitative capability that later on we can apply to a much more interesting, complex, but more interesting system. So, um, okay, I'm going to pause just for a few seconds. Any questions so far? Did you go? I'm kind of confused at what this, what the partial derivative part is in the end. Are you just, you're just seeing how? I'm okay. I, I'm, I, I, yeah, good. Uh, that's good. <laughs> I, 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 I think I appreciate that question. So that, so Austin, you have. To, uh, I was just going to say I think a good amount of us have never taken calculus three to learn partial derivative. I don't know what it is. Oh. I'm glad everybody brought this up. Okay, let's not <laughs> worry about partial derivative. If I tell you something about, sure, uh, we have, let's take a step back. If I, okay, I'll come back here, rewrite this. It's easier probably this way. Um, 
let's see, now we know if we have, if for the system, the Gibbs energy change can be caused by pressure and the temperature after that derivation, right? So we can say it can be, right? So, so this is, what we mean is if you alter the temperature pressure, the, they're going to cause the change of the Gibbs energy by movement throughout this. We don't do any partial derivative yet. But we'll just say, okay, imagine we we'll say, oh, add a constant temperature. How the Gibbs energy can be changed by pressure? Well, this term is going to drop out, right? So then you will have a situation of dG equals B. You can simply say, okay, that's how the time change of the, uh, of the Gibbs energy to the pressure. Or if you talk about the Gibbs energy, molar Gibbs energy, and then that's the molar energy. If you don't care about the whole wax, the Gibbs energy of the whole system, if you just observe one more of them, then you look at that one more of that part of its volume. Does this make sense? So, so we don't, it's virtual, it's just a, it's a, for mathematical convenience, sometimes we say this way. But this is virtually what we're doing over there. I mean, similarly, we can say, okay, well, other situations are constant pressure, the dg equals to uh, minus dt, because the, that term drops off. But the dp is zero, it doesn't change. So uh, then if you, can, if you only look at one more of the water, the dgm, so virtually, for every tiny change of temperature, you can cause tiny change of the molar Gibbs energy by whatever the molar entropy is. Does that make sense, Harry? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's actually it, it was just because sometimes you know people when you try to explain this, every time I have to write it down I have constant T do this. So people are like okay, well every time I say that we just do this, we just put a bigger parenthesis, put a little T. So that just kind of a. a <laughs> Instead of trying to say this every time, we just go, that's what it is. There's no, no fancy. But obviously, if you haven't done that, don't worry about this. We're not going to ask you to do a lot of partial derivatives. But that was really what it is here. OK, um, so uh, one interesting application of this is I'm coming back to Aaron's original question is it turns out you can change Gibbs energy uh, by, uh, by pressure when you add constant temperature. And this happens much more uh, significantly for gas, right? Because the gas usually have a much bigger molar volume than the, uh, a, a, a solid or liquid. So if you look at the slope, it's gigantic. If you add, apply, if you apply pressure, the gas is going to definitely, the Gibbs energy is going to increase like crazy. Whereas you apply pressure to the ice the cube, yeah, you increase, but not a whole, not a whole lot. That's all you can get the idea. And you can be even more quantitative. Let's just use this example. For example, you can say, hey, the, let's talk about ideal gas. And the molar gives, gives any change would be the molar. But for the ideal gas, though, we can actually uh, use, again, a state function. The, because it's not n equals 1, right? So because we use molar per mole, right? So, you can actually plug in this equation to get a very uh, useful quantity later on. So now you can say, well, okay, basically the dg molar would be p r t d p. So this means if you actually take a ideal gas, you pressure them, and you can actually calculate the amount of gas and then you change quantitatively very well. So let's say what you do is the gas going to pressure two to pressure minus pressure one. Okay. Let's get the pressure to uh, pressure one. Virtually is integration of this at P1 and P2. Or integration of P1, P2. And that's what uh, if you, again, we used this a lot earlier, the natural log. So basically it's RT, natural log, P2 over P1. So, so you can see for ideal gas, if you add pressure, 
you virtually increase gift energy by a very familiar quantity. We have seen this quite a few times. Entropy work here, natural log of P2, P1. Okay. Now, um, the most important thing today is actually understand, because the, the, this equation is going to be used a lot throughout the application uh, of phase transition or later on. That is, the Gibbs energy can be altered by temperature and pressure. And we derived this. Uh, but I hope that this uh, background information will give you some sense on why we do this and how this can be used. Uh, then, once we establish this, we can actually uh, apply a lot of the quantitative analysis first to phase transition, and later uh, we will move on to how about protein folding. And so don't worry about it, I'm going to try to upload the video, but you can take a picture as well, yeah. Okay, uh, any questions? Uh, yeah. So, if it is a spontaneous Reaction, right? yeah. So then S would, would be negative, correct? Delta S at the TP. Okay. Um, don't get confused. Right now, we're trying to see how the temperature pressure of a system can be used to alter the Gibbs energy of the system. Mm -hmm. But still, but I think you are the one asking a lot of questions. What's the point of a calculator? Uh, the uh, Gibbs energy temperature pressure when the previous lecture we keep saying oh wait a minute uh, when you consider spontaneous the starting point end point has to be the same temperature pressure well here's actually the answer to your original question which is what we're looking at is when you look at uh, the system going to point A point B is T P T P you can compare the delta G something may not be spontaneous right but what you can do is you can say, hey, I'm going to alter this. Uh, and then I can calculate. Now, all of a sudden, originally did not go, it could go. This is what we're doing. So we end up doing a lot of the calculation by cross over the temperatures because we want to alter the equilibrium spontaneous of this as a new temperature pressure. So this, this gives us the ability to do so. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about this. Uh, the, the remaining of this uh, uh, week's lecture will focus on finishing this discussion. We'll apply to you a few examples in the phase transition. And when you prepare for midterm exam one, uh, we will uh, pretty much cover up to the end of Friday's uh, material for this week, uh, which corresponds to uh, chapter section 3.6. So if you start reading about it, that's where it is. Um, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna talk to Mark a little bit about the the, sure, the review questions relevance to what we covered so far.